Good morning. Can you hear me? Great. So I'm Paul Fain. I'm the news editor at Inside Higher Ed and your moderator for this morning. Seated to my left, we have a, not a lot of time for this panel, so I'm not going to give you the full uh, stellar bios of these folks, but just their name and title so we can jump right into the discussion. But to my left, I have Matt Gee, co-founder and CEO of Bright Hive. To his left, Sarah Steinberg, the Vice President of Global Philanthropy at J.P. Morgan Chase & Co. And to her left, Todd Sanders, President and CEO of the Greater Phoenix Chamber. So we're gonna make this concrete to start and, and, uh, and jump right in with, with Todd. And if you could talk a little bit about the, the gaps that you've closed using workforce data between jobs and education and, and how that's actually played out in the last sure. couple years in Phoenix. Well, thank you and uh, appreciate the opportunity. I do wanna take a moment to thank the, the US Chamber, uh, Tom Donahue, Cheryl, Jason, the team, uh, such an incredible thing that they're doing on a nationwide basis, I think, for not only for the business community, but for people looking to really empower themselves. Uh, and I think that's really what uh, dro drove us at the chamber, as we did the work of uh, keeping businesses in Phoenix and helping them grow. Their big challenge uh, has been uh, workforce, as, as you all know, and I think as the, the audience knows. So we formed a, a variety of collaboratives. One of them was a, a cyber uh, security collaborative. Um, in Arizona, between eight and 10,000 jobs that we can't fill. Uh, so clearly a big need. Uh, and what we ended up doing is we sort of naively brought the education folks and industry to the table. Um, and and uh, think about sort of a, well, I'll, I'll, I'll mix it up since we're, we're in DC, a, you know, a Fox or a CNN panel um, and what that looks like. Um, that's kind of what it looked like. I think uh, the business guys were uh, convinced that it was the, the fault of the educators and the educators were, were you know, basically saying it's not our fault or we're just not getting clear signals. Um, and uh, it was a really interesting moment for us as we saw the, the problem and it really, we had to look in the mirror. We were the problem. Um, so what we ended up doing is sort of separating the two sides and sitting down with, with industry and saying, what is it you really need? And it turns out that, you know, for instance, for the same job, we had 30 different titles, different requirements, and we were sending really bad signals to the educators, so of course they couldn't ever fill, fill that commitment. They, they were set up to fail. So we took about six months to really standardize what it is that they were looking for, uh, a very labor intensive process. And really what we ended up doing is, what it was is the analog equivalent of JDX. Um, something that we could have done in very short order took us six months. Great, excellent results, everyone's happy, but we're probably now outdated. And to imagine going through that exercise again, um, and again, it doesn't work. So I think these are the kinds of things that we're doing, um, and I think what makes us so excited with JDX is this is how we can really create um, uh, a very sustainable and practical way of doing this that will obviously fill a need, but also create opportunities uh, across our community. Well, it's a great start, and my, my readers will be glad to hear that it's not all higher ed's fault, but there's, there's blame to-, to Yeah, they were, to they, they were pleased, I think. <laughs> all right. Um, so Sarah, can you, can you take us a step back and talk a little bit about the, what data standards are, what they should be, what's out there, and what's still needed? Yeah, so first of all, yeah, echo Todd's thanks to, to Jason and Cheryl and, and the work that they've led here, because it's, it's truly groundbreaking. So, you know, previously, we had, as we were looking to sort of facilitate this alignment between the supply side and the demand side of the labor market, we had a couple different places where educators and, and training providers could look. So they could look to sort of government sources of data, which were largely survey based. They could look to this new sort of real time labor market information that's scouring the web, looking at job postings on an ongoing basis. Um, but the reality is who better knows what jobs, what skills, what credentials are in demand than employers themselves. And so over the last five years that J.P. Morgan Chase has been supporting uh, this work facilitating uh, labor market alignment between supply and demand, uh, we have so supported so many of these tables that Todd just described 
described, you know, where you're bringing together uh, the subject matter experts from industry and employers, and you're bringing together educators, community college, training providers, and they're, they're doing this really hard work, but it's so labor intensive, right? I'm sure you many people in this room have sat at these tables. It's, it's a lot of time, it's a lot of meetings, um, and you know, if you're an employer, you usually have another job, which is running a business. Um, so I think the, the great promise of this sort of technology and really leveraging data standards is that you can have a standardized, automated, systematic way to have this exchange of information on an ongoing basis. So you're not sort of constantly having to come to that table again and update what you're looking for as you know technology changes what occupations are doing as, as we're seeing happening so often. Great, thank you. So Matt, um, can you talk a little bit about what's happening in the marketplace right now with data standards, what the audience should know, what's happening right now? Sure, yeah. Uh, so I'll also echo thanks to Jason Sherrill and the team. Um, you know, I'm just a, a data nerd, and a lot of times data nerds don't get to be on stages like this. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty more excited so to be these here. Days, yeah. that, that's true. I guess we, we, we get a little bit more time on. <laughs> you all are hot. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, we go to the same yeah. barber shop, by the <laughs> that's way. That's right. Yeah, we got the same barber Phenomenal. <laughs> Uh, so I think one of the things that uh, Todd hit on that uh, is really powerful is that in talking about their experience with, with TPM, he really highlighted that uh, in some ways the, the, core, the crux of the issue is this translation issue between the employers and uh, educators and, and individuals. Right? And we have three languages in some ways that are, that are spoken in the talent marketplace. Right? The language of employers saying, hey, this is what we need. Uh, the language of educators saying, hey, this is what we offer, come, come get credentials here. And the language of job seekers saying, hey, this is what I've earned, this is what I've got. And, and they actually are three separate languages when, when you look at the data. Um, but we are in a kind of Rosetta Stone moment uh, for the talent marketplace, which is really exciting. That those three languages and, uh, and the, the systems that are they're used by each of those uh, uh, set of constituencies to speak are figuring out how to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And that's really what data standards are about. So in, uh, for education and training providers, right, we've got a, a fantastic effort that's being led by Credential Engine uh, that's really focused on helping those education training providers express, speak the language of the, the credentials that they're offering in, in a common way using something called Credential Transparency Description Language. It's a language. Uh, second, for individuals, you know, trying to, to signal out saying, this is what I've earned, this is what I know, this is why you should hire me. You've got fantastic uh, data standardization efforts uh, called open badges and open pathways and um, comprehensive learner record uh, efforts <coughs> that are making it easier for those individuals to signal in a way that's portable across a bunch of different platforms and really have control and ownership of those records. Uh, and then lastly, as uh, Jason highlighted, what we're launching with, uh, what the Chamber's launching with uh, the Jobs Data Exchange is aimed at helping uh, employers and the systems that they already use, those HR information systems, the applicant tracking software systems, the platforms that, that employers are already connected with and working on, uh, be able to speak a more common language uh, and signal out to the marketplace. And that's, that's incredibly exciting. And the Chamber's found a way to bring those three different efforts around standardization together, not just to be able to speak the same language better within a vertical, but translate across. And that's a big part of what the T3 Innovation Network that Jason uh, mentioned is helping harmonize. And that uh, is incredibly exciting. Great. Todd, uh, having been in the translator or the broker of these sort of uh, conversations, can you talk a little bit about how to best do what Matt's saying to sync up these signals across all the stakeholders. Well, and, and not to get too platitudinous, but really it, it takes a village. Uh, and you, what you have to do, I think, is uh, once you can show, for instance, uh, your constituency that you have something that's reliable um, and that, that they can not only use to, um, you know, make sure their, their systems are, are solid, um, but also em employees or, or perhaps uh, potential uh, employees are using it. I think that starts to spin the, the, the wheel for us. 
Uh, we've, we've seen it in some of the other, the, the other applications that we've used. So uh, if you have the commitment of business, um, then all of a sudden the education providers start to see it. They start to see those signals. Um, and then, you, then as, as you talked about this, uh, this Rosetta Stone moment, well, all of a sudden employees start to see it. Um, and once there's confidence in the system, people start to utilize it and um, it starts to build momentum. So for us, you know, that's what makes this so exciting. If we can really start to, to use this in a much broader way, um, start to bring, for instance, state players into it and, uh, or, or city players into it, um, that starts to build sort of a robust system where people are going to rely on it and use it. You're, are you at the point where there's buy-in and people are making better decisions around programs? You know, it's starting to happen, and I think the cybersecurity um, ex experience was really a touchstone for us because uh, once industry saw that it could work, um, then they were bought in. I, as, as you mentioned, you know, th these folks have day jobs. Uh, and they're trying to run a business, and so they're, they don't have the time to sort of go off on, on wild goose chases. They need something that they know they can rely on, and once they see that and that, that it works and that it's actually better than what they've got, um, then there's buy-in. Sure, sure. Sarah, could you talk about what the exchange, could, the role that it could play in, in kind of building on this and why now is the moment that really makes it mo most valuable? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, as you all know, employers are, are largely struggling with this question of, one, how do, I, um, how do I build my talent pipeline so that I can get in this, in this tight labor market the, the talent that I need to grow my business and expand? And also increasingly thinking about how do, I, um, how do I diversify my workforce, right? How do I make sure that my workforce is sort of representative of, of the clients that we're serving? Um, and so I think you know, this sort of having these data standards and using this technology can facilitate that um, in a number of ways. Matt talked a little bit about uh, the credential registry. Well, one of the promises of this tool is that um, an employer could, in theory, use this to compare credentials that they know with credentials that they're less familiar with. So if you already know as an employer that you are getting uh, great talent from one particular program at one school, you could then go and use this sort of common language describing credentials to say, oh, well, actually, there's this school and this program and this program that are all offering a credential that's very similar. So maybe I can go out and I can recruit from those schools and I can potentially get the talent that I'm not getting at the, the local school that I'm already familiar with and also begin to diversify my workforce. So I think it, it meets a lot of demands that are pretty pressing in today's labor market. And, you know, one of the things that is confusing to me is how the standards kind of talk to each other, like how, how globally standardized we need. Can you, it's a little follow-up here, but how, how could the exchange and the credential engine kind of work together? I know these are new products, but. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and Matt can say more about this because he, he's been working on this pretty intimately. But, you know, w the way I see it is that um, as an employer, as you're going through this process of sort of systematically projecting your, your labor market demand, identifying the occupations that you have the highest demand for, tagging them with certain skills um, and qualifications and credentials. In theory, what you could do is actually plug that into the language that the credential engine is developing that describes credentials. So you could see there, there's sort of a, a commonality there. So you could then identify as an employer what are the, the range of credentials that will get you what you want in this occupation. Um, and as a training provider or as a student, you can look at certain occupations and see what credentials you can acquire in your, um, in your local educational institutions that would get you into those jobs. Great, thank you. And do you want to follow up on that? Maybe you look like you, you do. Sure, <laughs> I mean, I can uh, maybe add just a, one layer of detail uh, if, it, if it's helpful uh, to folks. So one of the great things that, the, that um, Credential Engine, for example, has, has done that is, is a core part of JDX is it's adopted in what it's doing, in the way it's expressing out uh, this information. Um, what Jason mentioned in his intro, this, this word you may have heard, semantic web, um, which essentially just means that you're not just having to, it's, it's not about using the same words or the same credential, it's about having the same meaning. And that's the really powerful thing, mm -hmm. is that you don't have to use the same word anymore for uh, a credential 
um, that's expressed um, by uh, an educational institution on a credential engine language and a, a credentialing uh, requirement uh, that's expressed in a job posting to be linked together. And that's, that's the real power of it. You know, it's a good panel when, as a journalist, I'm taking notes on stage for a story. <laughs> um, so, so Matt, let's, let's, let's talk about technology, and there's obviously a lot of talk about technology disrupting the workforce, the workplace. Um, how can it play a role in the use of data in uh, making better decisions about jobs and preparation? Oh, uh, yeah, so how do the robots not just kill jobs, right. but maybe uh, help us uh, get <laughs> new jobs? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So I, interesting enough, I was, I was just in San Francisco last week, uh, or yeah, la, uh, yesterday. Uh, oh man, it, it was a red eye, so forgive me. Um, and it was, uh, it was a convening of all of the AI folks at Facebook and Google and Amazon, right? the folks who are building the algorithms that are supposed to put all of us out of work. Um, and the, the most interesting thing about this, this day-long convening, the conversations that were happening and the demonstrations of what folks were building, is that um, the plurality of what was being shown and what was being built uh, was actually about adding value directly to the talent marketplace. It, it wasn't about putting uh, folks out of work as much as uh, figuring out how to reduce frictions in getting people to work. And that, to me, is incredibly exciting, that there's this, there's this amazing balance that's happening in the innovation marketplace around emergent technologies that aren't just about job destruction. It's about new job creation and, and removing frictions to, uh, to, um, to find jobs. And, and those are kind of three key areas where I, I think it's, it's worth noting. One of the areas that artificial intelligence is actually being used today uh, is making it easier for individuals to search and discover job opportunities on the web. Uh, you've heard everything from you know, Google for jobs to Facebook for jobs to LinkedIn being able to make better personalized recommendations. All of those things are being powered by some of the core technologies uh, that, that we are also scared about. Um, second, personalized pathing, that better recommendations for you based on what you know or for you as a business based on what you need. Uh, that's using the exact same technology that is used to recommend movies to you uh, in your Netflix queue. And uh, that's, uh, that's emerging as a, as a key category that's reducing, again, frictions in the labor market. And then lastly is actually, and this is probably the most profound way that technology is changing the labor market, um, is the creation of new jobs and speeding up the pace of those new tasks and new jobs that, um, that we need to be able to do. And that puts an enormous amount of pressure on those education and training institutions to keep up with the pace of new opportunity creation that's emerging out of, uh, out of the technologies themselves. Great, great. So Todd, you, you, you mentioned briefly the role of states. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about how states, local workforce boards can play a role with this new data infrastructure? You know, I've um, been writing a bit about what's going on in Colorado. It sounds like there's a lot of smart uh, targeted subsidization of data-fueled training programs. but. What, what, what works, what, sh what should states be doing? Well, I, I'll say that uh, the key to this is, is leadership. Governor Ducey uh, has been all in as it relates to uh, how, growing the economy, and I think he sees the, the labor part of the equation as really key. So we're, we're really fortunate to have a very strong partner, um, the state of Arizona. Matter of fact, we have our data guru here, uh, Trevor Stokes, uh, and he is sort of a equivalent of our Matt. Um, and, and to have uh, the state all in uh, as it relates to uh, data and ensuring that, that we have something that's comprehensive and, and, and that also is standardized is good. I think one of the nice things for us as we've, we're talking is that this will allow us to have something that's not sort of lagging indicators, but real-time data in terms of what's happening. And I think what's important about this, the state approach is that that also funnels down into the counties and cities. Right. Uh, Phoenix is, is obviously the largest city in on Arizona, but you've got, you've got Tucson and you've got a lot of small communities in it. The state can play a major leading role, then all of a sudden that starts to trickle down and really uh, empower local communities to do this work as well. So we found that approach to be, to be really good. Obviously have a very strong partnership with the city of Phoenix. Um, their, their, um, their, their job, um, their, their function as it relates to the, to the job market 
I think has been for us to work with them in, in partnership to draw down some federal dollars to do some of the work we've, we've done. We've obviously draw, uh, been able to draw down other uh, private sector dollars, but I think that partnership has been key for us. Absolutely. Sarah, can, can, we've talked a little bit about how AI and, and other technologies uh, could actually improve uh, the talent marketplace, but could you talk about the role of equity and um, how that might be impacted by some of the, the tools that we're discussing? Yeah, so I mean, we've, we've talked a lot about the promise here of, of data standards and being able to sort of facilitate more skills-based hiring, increase efficiency, lower costs on the part of both the employer and the job seeker, um, potentially get around that, that sort of issue of employers kind of defaulting to the bachelor's degree as a proxy for other skills, right, which tends to eliminate large populations of people who don't have that but might have the skills that they need to be successful in the job. Um, of course, the, the challenge here is that uh, data is, is really only as, as, data is really all about how you use it, right? So you have to think a lot about the tools that you're developing for different stakeholders to use this data. And when you're thinking about equity, you really need to be concerned about a couple things. One is, um, just digital access and digital literacy. So a lot of populations don't have a laptop in their home. They're using their, their phone to really search and, and use this technology. Um, so as you're kind of designing tools, you need to think about sort of user-centered design. Uh, if, if your populations that you're looking to reach need, need mobile accessibility, make sure that your apps are mobile um, optimized. Um, and then the second thing, <clears throat> which is probably the bigger challenge, is that um, you know, algorithms are made by humans with human biases uh, and human prejudices. And so we've seen a couple sort of high profile uh, op um, examples of that recently where algorithms that were designed to sort of search talent were actually promoting biases against women and people of color. Um, and I think you have to sort of be aware that the tools are, are really only as good as the humans that are kind of designing them and using them and contributing information to them. And, and so it doesn't, the use of sort of data standards and tools has tremendous opportunity, but it doesn't take away from the need for um, addressing our own biases and prejudices as humans. Matt, do you have any, anything to add on that, that, that last piece of how algorithms can, can best kind of build that in? Um, so I think Sarah hit on it. Uh, there is there is uh, the pr profound uh, challenge in it when we're building these things out and applying them uh, that any algorithm is only as good as uh, actually the, the data that it's trained on. And a lot of times the information that we use um, comes from human systems that have historical biases, and that bias gets baked in to the algorithm from there on out. Uh, one specific example of this is we, we talked a little bit about translate recommendation engines that might recommend different career paths for folks. It turns out if you look really closely at the math for the, how those algorithms work, they're trained on the way that people describe um, different job opportunities just in, in, uh, on, the, on the World Wide Web. And uh, it turns out that most of the time when people are describing the job of a doctor, uh, in and around the words are very um, male characteristics. They, it's on, on the internet, doctors are generally associated with male identity, and, um, and nurses, female identity. And so what actually ends up happening is those same algorithms that recommend different paths have at a really low level, maleness for doctor and femaleness for, for a nurse. And if we're not careful, right, we will make sure, we will recommend to all boys, hey, go be a doctor and all girls go be a nurse. And things like that, they're, they're very subtle, but they're, they're pernicious and, and they're things that, that we can, we have to um, police and act, actively work to avoid. The great news is you got a lot of f smart folks trying to work on this on the algorithm side, but they're not gonna catch it unless the folks actually using the systems building, uh, making decisions based on, uh, on, on the data and, and the things they procure are actually able um, to, to call out the challenge. Well, to, to that point, I think yeah, the please. cultural component is so important. Right? Mm -hmm. There was an example where we were trying to um, empower uh, Latinos to 
move into uh, uh, Barrett's Honors College at, at ASU. And I think one of the things that was the, kind of one of the problems was they invited the, the kids in to understand why they should pick Barrett's uh, over, for instance, uh, Cornell or, or Yale or Harvard. And they were there with their families and, and the families don't even know they really had no idea what Coral, uh, Cornell or, or Harvard or Yale was, and I think we could just go down the road to a technical school, so why would I want my kid, and, and so I think they weren't really talking to the families in a way that was culturally competent. So I think that the technology is important, but I think the human element is really critical here, and I think you can really miss something if you don't necessarily understand the audience that you're talking to, or even the language that you're speaking. Absolutely, and that, you know, I guess to the point we're hearing more and more, uh, particularly given shifting demographics of college students, that first generation college student is a, a lot of challenges they face that are really subtle but important um, that are gonna have to be accounted for. So, so Matt, since I threw one challenge away, I'll, I'll throw another one. Um, okay. Given, uh, like yeah, well, you're a, you're a data guy, so you did a challenge. Okay. So okay. Uh, given how kind of fragmented and siloed data is these days, um, we've got breaches and concerns about privacy. Do you feel like it's realistic that we're headed towards a place where there's more access to good data mm -hmm. around jobs or, or, or do we have some barriers to, to break before we can really get optimistic there? Uh, you know, I think we are in the middle of a really important conversation as a society right now about the, the power and, and, and the role of data and technology in our own lives mm -hmm. and the degree to which we want it to control us or we control it. And, um, and we, are in, we are brokering a new deal for data, right? Um, and just actually today, right now, uh, across the country in, in Denver, there's a, a conference very similar to this called Educause that's going on, where a bunch of technologists um, are having a, a, a very serious conversation about how to make individual student records, right? The, the information that, that, that uh, is about you, about the, the credentials you've earned, the transcript that you have at one college, the <laughs> certificate you earned at, at another institution, making that your data and not the company that sells the big system that, um, that gets to mine the data and, and recommend things to, to other people. Um, and that's, that, that kind of, um, the, the technological capability of doing that, of providing us control, individual control of our own information is there. It's actually mostly a matter of, of will and a matter of driving interest from us as, as consumers. And I think that's, uh, that's an incredibly important moment for all of us to show up to. To add on that. Well, yeah, I would, just, I would just add to that um, transparency is part of this too. So all of the sort of tools that we've talked about today in, in facilitating labor market transparency are, are open source. And so that adds a level of, you know, anyone can go in and kind of look at this and, and make judgments and criticisms and, and point, out, uh, point out what's good and what's wrong with it. So I think that's also an important angle. So, uh, and, and, you know, you mentioned uh, kind of individualized data, and I was thinking about the ongoing discussion, we are in this town here in Washington, about a federal student unit record. Um, you know, are, are there things that the federal government could do um, to, to kind of increase the pace of development of these tools, or, or is this something best not, um, the federal government kind of let the market continue to, to develop, anyone wanna? Any, anything that they could do right now <laughs> to help out. Head after the after the conference, head down to Congress, and you know maybe after about an hour there, you'll figure out they're probably not the right solution. Uh, I, I honestly think that the, that the private sector and thinking about what the U.S. Chamber has done and the foundation has done, I think the the, the I really do think the private sector has, um, I think a better way of doing it, and and I think probably the the way we should be looking. It really doesn't seem like we're anywhere close to a federal student data record, so. I'll, I'll just add something briefly that I think, I, I was in a conversation with some folks at Department of Ed uh, a little while ago, and, and they, um, they highlighted, I think, one of the biggest challenges in policy making around data, which is figuring out how we balance data misuse with data missed use. Um, because that latter thing, right, often our view on uh, keeping anything from malicious from happening with data prevents us from doing a lot of really useful things that'll help increase individual opportunity. And if we 
if we blind ourselves to the value that we can create um, in, with, with connected data, with open data, with transparent algorithms, uh, and simply myopically focus on all the many ways that we might possibly be harmed, then we'll, I think we'll make some wrong policy choices. Sure. Yeah, well, and also, I, yeah. I, I would just add, we, we talked about this a little bit before about the work that's happening in states, but a lot of this information is, is at the state level, and there's a lot of really great innovative partnerships that are happening between state government, state institutions of higher education, industry, um, uh, and, and, and I think there's a lot of work that can be done at the state level as well. Absolutely. You know, um, I mean this sincerely. I, I hear a lot about Arizona being ahead of the curve on this. I mentioned Colorado, but are there other states that folks should look at? You know, Washington, I know, does a lot. Yeah, I mean, one that I would point to is um, Indiana. So we talked about the, the credential registry. Indiana is on track to have all of its credentials offered by public institutions in the registry by the end of this year. And they've really, to get back to that sort of issue of the tipping point where you have everyone kind of using these data standards to the extent that it, it finally becomes valuable for everyone involved to really engage in this. Um, they're really getting there, particularly in the healthcare industry where they have all of the various state licenses around healthcare. So you now see the, the emergence of different tools by various health Healthcare professional associations designed to help healthcare workers um, sort of across the sector navigate the licensing and credentials that they need in order to get good jobs in the industry. So, so Indiana is always one state that I like to point to. Um, Todd, can you talk, I mean, having done some of this work already and, and seen it bear fruit, what, what does the empowered worker look like? What are some of the jobs that you're seeing uh, more efficiently uh, you know, had that pipeline with f less friction than we've seen. Yet. Well, and you know, I think it was interesting, I was listening to what Tom was saying about uh, knowledge being the great equalizer, and I think that's really been key for us is, as we've uh, started to work with companies, for instance, J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, the financial services sector, there is a desperate need for folks, for instance, that could pass a Series 7 um, in, in Arizona. And matter of fact, there was, there was actually a, a scenario where uh, uh, one of the companies was moving jobs to the East Coast because um, they were able to find that talent much more readily uh, in the East Coast. And so what we've done uh, with, with that information is to put together a very unique cohort training model where we're actually doing a lot of that training, for instance, for the Series 7 or for uh, a new exam called the SIE exam um, prior to them actually entering into that system, um, ensuring that they're, uh, that they're ready to go on day one uh, and that has really changed the dynamic. So this, this failure rate that was around 30% is, is now, for, for the classes that we're sending through, um, is, is in the single digits, which, which I think has really started to, started to really change um, the way that companies are looking at Phoenix and empowering people. And I think one of the things that's been, I think, a unique opportunity is um, they were not only talking about just needing people, but they needed diversity. And yep. we have the opportunity to bring diverse people into this marketplace. Um, and when I think about the work that, that, that our chamber does, uh, it's, it's incredibly important that we're keeping companies in, in Phoenix and we're helping them grow. But when you think about sort of the ultimate, sort of the, the, the holy grail of economic development is, is, is putting more people into the economy, breaking that cycle of poverty, this work that we're doing with the financial services sector is allowing us to take people who would normally not have an opportunity to come into these types of positions and giving them those opportunities. And for someone who, for instance, grew up in a poor part of Phoenix that was, uh, you know, went to a Title I school, had fruit and reduced lunch, um, for them to go back to those communities and for their kids not to, not to even understand what that is, that's really what that's all about. And, and you hear about other companies doing this. So for instance, we had a discussion with Amazon. Amazon, uh, one of our sponsors, by the way, um, is actually taking this data out there and looking at leading indicators and taking their entry level folks and giving them the opportunity to build their, their skills, to, to add to their, their skill sets and maybe even in ways that don't, don't necessarily complement Amazon so that they can go out there um, and, and really uh, um, take advantage of these new opportunities. So really interesting the way that this can 
sort of democratize uh, and empower communities and really do this idea that I, I guess what, where we are today with this have and have nots in our country, the idea that you could actually close that gap through technology. So thank you, Matt. Kudos to you. Good stuff. Um, and that's where I think we've seen um, a real difference in our community, not only in keeping companies, but also offering opportunities and empowering people, especially uh, uh, people uh, that, that are maybe outside of the system today. Uh, Sarah, Matt, any, any industries, professions you think are particularly poised to, to use this sort of data standard? I mean, I'm, I'm hearing from some of them, but I'm curious what, what people should be watching as kind of first adopter industries. I mean, I already talked a little bit about healthcare. I think that that's a big one. Um, technology is another big one. Um, really one of the promises that I see in these data standards, though, is that they can um, inform educators on an ongoing basis about how sectors are changing. So as we're thinking about kind of the future of work, and Matt was talking about you know, technology and how that's changing what jobs look like, um, having these sorts of uh, data standards available to, to educators and training providers to understand, well, this is what this job was you know, five years ago, but it, it looks very different now and you need different skills, so we're gonna adjust our curriculum to really give you those skills that you need to be successful in that job going forward. I think that's, that's one of the, the great promises of, of this uh, project. And uh, one of the things that really enables this project to hit the ground running is industries that have done the hard work of saying, all right, let's, let's think about what we do on a daily basis as a nurse, as a cybersecurity expert, and, and really try to break that down into competencies and skills. And, and then let's make that information, that, that competency model for a prototypical job in our industry, let's make that available on the World Wide Web. That, that process right, has actually been done by uh, a, a, an initial set of industries, like cybersecurity, they're actually one of the ones that have done really fantastic work on this. And that, pro that really provides the raw fuel that you need in order to drive uh, something like JDX. And so ideally, this can become also a really big carrot for some, of, from, for some of those maybe lagging industries to say it's worth, um, worth doing that work up front that might be a little bit more human intensive to get the engine going. And then you can start the feedback loop and have that be updating on a more automated basis. You know, uh, to use a phrase of uh, Ryan Craig uh, from University Ventures, uh, the, the competency marketplace, he likes to say, where you have you know, the jobs where they've broken out the competencies and the job seekers can say, hey, I need these competencies. I can go seek yeah. out this, uh, this training. Um, to that end, do you see this work changing the signaling around credentials in key ways? There's a lot of interest in higher education and alternative credentials. I've written recently about Google created a, a kind of entry level IT support certificate where they do the curriculum themselves. Um, you know, if you had better data, better data standards, could, could we, I mean, obviously the four year degree is still the best ticket to the middle class, no question data wise at all, but it, could we open new pathways for folks with better data? Are you optimistic about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things I talked about is, you know, the, the large population of workers who don't have a bachelor's degree, right, if they have a way to sort of translate the, the competencies that they have earned, uh, the credentials that they have at the sub-BA level into a way that employers understand and can recognize, that opens up tremendous opportunity for, for workers to be successful with a variety of different sort of credentials and certificates and backgrounds. Well, I think too, I, I, you know, sort of back in the day, uh, yeah, you remember it was sort of like putting a dartboard in front of you and being blindfolded and you just threw a dart and hope, hope you hit something. Sure. And I think today, you know, the, the idea that you have to start at college isn't necessarily um, where, you, where, you have to, where you have to end up. I think um, you, can, you can start, you can start to, you can stack those credentials over time and you can end up with a four-year degree. But I think we're talking to so many different uh, employers and industries that aren't necessarily saying what we need today is a four-year degree, we need these skills, and, and so let's start there, and then you can stack those credentials and eventually perhaps get there, and I agree, no, no question that the, the, the road to sort of middle class is, is a four-year degree, but it's not the only way. Absolutely. Yep. 
I think of the example of uh, AT&T in Dallas and their partnership with Year Up and the Dallas Community College System, where they said, you know, um, we can we can proactively is one of the major employers in the Dallas area. Right? We we can think more creatively about talent sourcing, and they reached out to Year Up and said, how can we more directly hire from graduates of Year Year Up, um, and uh, they started with the lowest hanging fruit. They said, well, let's start with our call centers um, and see if we can just identify what are the sk core skills and competencies that we might be able to uh, hire from and what particular year up opportunities and courses those map to. And uh, they ran this, it was so successful, they realized, wait, we don't have to just limit this to call centers. Let's expand it to entry level managerial positions. Let's expand it and that expansion is really uh, enabled by and uh, uh, by, by some of the core data and data standards that will allow them to scale it up from not just one position to to all positions, which is really exciting. Absolutely, and and you, a couple of those points made me think about when you think about alternative credential pathways, um, shorter term certificates, um, sub degree, uh, maybe even non credit certificates. That Todd mentioned the stackability. And um, it seems to me, and I, I would love to hear kind of your thoughts on this, but that data standards really make that possible, make that portability across industries, across regions. And if you, if you don't have a common language, you can't really ensure that somebody's learning and skills translates to that next level certificate. But um, anyone want to jump on that issue and how kind of to best harness that power for stackability? Well, probably scale is going to be is going to be key uh, because you're right. As, as long as you have standards, then you can start to plug things in. But uh, if you have sort of you know, things something in a in a vacuum, you, you aren't going to get the right scale. But if you can start to build that out, um, then then you have other sources starting to plug in, and, and it starts to really work. And you start to spin that wheel across industries, regions, state level. What are we talking when you when you mean scale, like? Well, I, I think ideally na nationally, but uh, as, as Sarah mentioned, I think you've got some really good state-based systems. So maybe we start with that, and you and you build it out. But 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 for instance, you know, J.P. Morgan Chase. I mean, they aren't they don't they aren't bound geographically at all. So how do you how do you serve, for instance, a, 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 a one of the largest companies in the world um, in a way that's not just uh, regionally or, or locally? You've got to be able to do it where they are. Absolutely. Yeah, and what, one of the things Indiana is doing by using the credential registry is actually using that uh, those, those data standards to facilitate transfer credits. Um, so creating a tool for students who have you know some credits at one institution to figure out how those transfer to other institutions. So that's sort of a good example of how you can kind of build that stackability. It's interesting. Uh, there's a Carlos Slim. Um, it actually about five years ago with his foundation developed a tool uh, for, and it's, it's only for um, people who have migrated to the United States. Um, and what it, what it basically is, is for entry level folks who've come here, they're you know, fresh from, from uh, Central, South America, and Mexico. And he's, he, what he did is he worked with um, uh, area, areas like hospitality and restaurants and created um, a, a series of standards with them. And what he did is he created a module uh, that people can use on their phones. Um, and you have this idea of someone who's maybe working at a hotel, uh, cleaning rooms, and she wants to move up to the next level and has created these modules. So she can take the, the, the exam, she can take, or take the, the, do the work, take the exams, and once she has passed successfully, um, Marriott or whoever gets actually a notification and she's able to move to that next level. And so that's a good example of, you know, a guy in the private sector who's, who decided to do something like this, but it, it, what, it, what it required was standardization across the spectrum and technology. And really what that did is that democratization of technology for anybody who had a phone um, was able to take where they were today and move up the ladder up and, and, and succeed. So it's interesting, I think, how, how, how this is being done today and how I think the model that we have, I think, um, if, as, we, as we keep expanding it can, can really make a difference nationally. Absolutely, so if I, if I quoted you right, uh, Matt, for some, some last thoughts here, I think you, you had a great uh, phrase here, the new deal for data. Um, how, how close are we to that becoming a reality as kind of a last thought? How early are we in this stage and, and what, what challenges do we need to overcome to really get there soon? Uh, I would just say it's happening now and if you leave it, leave it to just the data nerds like myself, it'll be terrible. Um, 
so I, the, I think the, <laughs> the main, I guess, call to action is that it's your data. It's your firm's data. It's your community's data. It's your individual data. And uh, I think it's important for us as a community, right, who cares about the functioning of the talent marketplace to show up to that conversation, to have opinions and, and express them and make sure that ultimately what we build together, right, the, this emerging almost nervous system of society, right, is, is the one we want. Um, so uh, I, I would say it's, it's happening now. Uh, make sure you show up. Great. Well, that's a great note to end on. Please join me in giving a hand of applause to our great panelists.